有宗教人啊，咁我。Right, uh, it's the appointed time, and we have formed a quorum. I now declare the meeting to order. Item one: confirmation of um, minutes of meeting, and two sets of minutes have been circulated to members, including the one held on the 14th of April, CB bracket four, 7:42, and also the special meeting held, paper number CB. Uh, Bracket uh, CB at one third one three one four. So, um, can I invite members to confirm? If there are no questions, then minutes confirm. Item two. Information papers issued since the last meeting. Since the last meeting, the secretariat received a letter from Madam Alice Mack, dated uh, May the twenty-first, uh, on issues relating to local telecommunication service. And in accordance with the instruction of the chairman, it has been circulated to members. And if members have no objections, then that will be circulated. Then, item three, date of next meeting and items for discussion for the regular meeting held in July. That will be held on the 14th of July, Monday, 2:30 at room three. And uh, issues for discussion: two items. One, progress update on digital economy, and two, information security. So these are the two items on the list of outstanding items for discussion. Items three and four. Any questions? If not, then those will be the two items for discussion at our next meeting. Next uh, item four. Progress update um, on the e-government development. First, uh, let us welcome the government team to the meeting. How many more meetings do we have before the end of the session? So far, we have scheduled just one more meeting on on the fourteenth of July. Just one more meeting. Yes, Mr. Christopher Chung. Well, I'll be asking questions uh, on the next item. Ms. Sito, I'd just like to know how many more meetings do we have? Just one, the one to be held on 14th of July. Madam Chair, sorry, I was uh, forming a quorum at the next door. Well, I can see that the Communications Authority is now dealing with the TV licensing issue. So before the end of the session, will we be able to follow that up? Or invite the communication authorities to come and brief us on the situation. With regard to the HKTV's application for free TV license, for well, the public consultation uh, has started, um, and a paper has been issued by the administration. Members are welcome to submit their views uh, directly to the CA. But then, if members would like to discuss that at our meeting. I think I'll leave that to the chairman to deal with. Madam Chair, can I suggest that um, well, last time, um, well, there were allegations of moving the goalposts and also the change of um, terms and so on. So we should uh, put that right to the CA and also the policy bureau at the start. With regard to the procedures, we will be following them through, as in the earlier exercises, so that uh, members of the public would. Be able to focus their attention on the relevant issues, and uh, for the July 14th meeting, if necessary, we can extend the meeting so that we can discuss that as well. All right, we'll see if we can incorporate that uh, in the meeting of July the 14th to see. Uh, so we'll see if it's possible, and then we will get back to you. All right, uh, I'll welcome to the administration's team on the latest um, progress um, on the e-government development. So please walk us through the. The paper, and then uh, we'll have a dis. We'll open the floor to discussion. In fact, um, our digital twenty one uh, strategy is to enable the delivery of the next generation of public services, and the OGCIO is responsible for coordinating efforts and supports uh, bureaus and departments in this regard. And uh, we have also committed uh, to providing updates to members on the progress of e-government de development with regard to um, cloud computing and also the. Uh, Uh, emergence of uh, big data and so on. So we will continue to make use of um, uh, IT to enhance the internal efficiency of uh, our government. 
and then uh, I'll defer to the um, to the government uh, information coordinator or the chief information coordinator who will give you more details. This Hong Kong compares uh, well with other places in terms of e-government. During the past year, in terms of our e-government um, program, we have uh, made good progress and uh, we have also achieved uh, good results. Well, in 2013, in December, we managed to roll out the government cloud platform or GovCloud for um, in providing a common platform for the hosting of common e-government services shared by bureaus and departments. And uh, we have also launched the uh, ELKS, the Electronic Record Keeping System, and so on. Well, the EGIS has also been rolled out um, in April uh, 2013. So that for the existing e-government services, well, in November last year, we managed to migrate government e-government services to the new EGIS, the e-government infrastructure services, and we managed to upgrade the services. And we have, well, it, after 2015, after the full rollout of this, other than the existing 118 e-government services, we will be able to host uh, 100 additional e-government services. And in sharing of government services, well, for the e-record keeping system um, that was launched in May 2014 in the government record service, and uh, in the coming year, we will be able to provide support to 30 bureaus and departments in providing data management service. And then in terms of e-procurement, since December 2013, bureaus and departments have adopted e-procurement for the purchase of IT products and services through the bulk purchase contracts. In April 2014, we also made available the full functions of e-procurement for the use by bureaus and departments to enable them to reap the benefits of conducting procurement electronically. And in terms of human resource management services, that has been rolled out in phases for the first batch of functional modules uh, that was developed and rolled out uh, to two early adopter bureaus and departments in the first half of 2014. We will conduct a review in the second half of 2014, hoping that more departments and bureaus can use that. And then in terms of, in terms of value-added reuse of public sector information, well, um, under the uh, Data One portal that was rolled out in March 2011, the, downloads, the number of downloads has been rising, and we are now providing some 16 types of PSI, encompassing some 2,000 data sets for free download and reuse. We plan that starting from 2015, we will be releasing public information in e-format so as to facilitate creative and value-added reuse in the development of mobile applications so that the public will be able to access those uh, uh, information. With regard to the MyGov um, Hong Kong, since its launch in December 2010, the number of accounts has continued to grow, and by April this year, the number has exceeded 200,000, representing an increase by some 43% over a year ago. To enhance user experience and meet the ever-increasing demand, we are developing the mobile version of MyGovHK, and the major features have already been launched in early 2014, and the full version will be ready in the third quarter of this year. Well, uh, with the more common use of uh, tablets and uh, smartphones, well, we have already introduced some 85 government mobile apps uh, for download by the public since March this year, covering a diverse, ra diverse range of areas, including traffic and so on. And in order to cope with the rising demand, we plan that uh, within 2014-15, we're going to roll out a further enhancement measures so as to assist bureaus and departments to plan and develop mobile apps to serve their business and service requirements in a cost-effective manner. And these uh, have also been set out in paragraph 15 of the paper. During the past year, in terms of the overall utilization of e-government services that has been rising, according to the recent e-service utilization survey, the overall utilization in 2013 when compared to 2014 was more than doubled 
and in order to facilitate persons with disabilities to access online information and services, about 90% of the 460 government websites have been enhanced to comply with the level AA of the latest version, <coughs> version 2.0 of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines promulgated by the W3C. The remaining websites will be enhanced to comply with the standard in 2014 and 15. On top of that, many bureaus and departments, including the uh, Health and Welfare Bu uh, Food and Health Bureau, and also the LCSD, and also the Lands Department, in um, rolling out uh, e-government uh, services, uh, good progress has been made, and uh, the details have been set out in the paper. And I don't propose to bother you with all the details here. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions? We have uh, Charles Mock and uh, Christopher Chung. Christopher Chung first. Uh, next are uh, Raymond Chen and Claudia Mo. First, uh, Christopher Chung. Madam Chair, I think uh, the progress has been slow and unsatisfactory in terms of e-government. For example, like um, um, e-certificate, well, very little progress has been made. So will there be further <coughs> enhancements or improvements? For example, in the past, uh, you will have to get a key for Hong Kong Post, and you will have to work very hard before anything can be done. So will people be that stupid in getting that key for nothing? So number one, it's not user-friendly, and number two, you have no idea as to what the public needs. So a lot of efforts have been put into that, uh, and yet uh, it's just a waste of time. And then as far as the public are concerned, uh, all they need is uh, user friendliness and convenience. All right, you talk about uh, free Wi-Fi or free gov Wi-Fi, but then it's very difficult to um, have access to that um, throughout the territory. So can you provide more free um, browsing services? Yes, many people will need that. Yes, you might think that um, uh, it's very costly, but then if you are able to provide that to them, the benefit that you can yield will be even greater because uh, if it's uh, more extensively rolled out, then more people will be able to use e-government services, or else uh, you will be asking them questions uh, here and there if they are if uh, such services only provided by private uh, internet service providers. That's not good. Well, when we go to Taiwan. Actually, they are doing that a lot better and a lot more convenient. So can you think about it uh, more carefully? Can you provide greater convenience to the public so that people will really find your e-government services more effective? Now, coming back to what you are doing now, very often when we try to go to the um, uh, the uh, the MyGov HK is not very convenient. All right, uh, it's tax payment period now, so you will have to meet the needs of the public at different times. You should at least uh, provide an icon so that there can be one touch access to your website. No, that's not the case. So you will have to make a number of uh, clicks before you can have access to the IRD website. So can you review that? All right, I uh, forgot to say that we do have time, but uh, let's limit the speaking time to four minutes, questions and answers included, uh, before we start the second round, because uh, more and more members may wish to speak, uh, and we may run out of time. Who would like to respond, Mr. Lai? Thank you, Mr. Chong, for your question. On e-certificate, it's true that on the ease of use, and uh, there are questions, um, and indeed there is room for uh, further improvement. And for the latest version, no CD-ROM is needed. Uh, when a USB drive is all it takes for is initiation, so it's uh, easier um, for use. And the importance of e-certificate is that it allows more uh, tra transactions to be carried out safely. The utilization depends on um, how many systems have subscribed the e-certificate system. And uh, there are systems that require a higher level of security 
and e-certificates are used for authenticating identities. And this is uh, almost a um, mandatory uh, certificate for e-check. Uh, and under the new Digital 21 strategy, we are going to provide each and every one in Hong Kong a free e-certificate. And with a wider scope of application, uh, I believe that uh, e-certificates would be more easier to use and will more widely be used. As for my Gov HK portal for um, t filing tax return and paying taxes, well, in fact, the IRD's website has improved. There is no need for e-certificates to be used. Only a personal account is needed. So um, in terms of uh, the uh, user friendliness, it's uh, much easier now. Mr. Christopher Jung? Well, actually, your time is up. Perhaps you should wait for another round. Well, filing tax return, I think, is just the same as before, because I still use uh, computer to file my tax return. Mr. Charles Mock, thank you. Now, on e-government uh, services, yes, we hear annual reports, but without indicators or KPIs, if you only tell us that the progress is good, then, well, inevitably, Mr. Jong will be asking the same questions every year because he thinks it's not good enough. That's because we do not have objective indicators. So please consider how you can improve this. Now, my question is on government departments and on how... Um, the application of e-services uh, can be implemented among government departments. This morning, I uh, contacted a government department to discuss with uh, the uh, companies um, of a certain sector, and that government department has um, abundant information on uh, the companies, and uh, it said that uh, they cannot make this information public because uh, they have to deal with the FSTB or um, the use will be subject to very stringent conditions. And they said that they can't do anything. It has to do with the uh, DOJ. And they also want to prepare API for um, API keys for companies to access such information. But when the department asks uh, their respective bureaus for money to implement this, they don't get the bureaus to support. So I think uh, it's a very thorny issue for the CDB. Um, but, uh, but you are supposed to be the intermediary. If you cannot perform this role, then that is a big problem. I see for government departments, their colleagues are really in a plight. They want to make the information available, but they cannot do that. And they know all the information are, are lying around uh, un untouched, and yet they cannot do anything about it. Um, and I believe this is not just a problem of one government department. How can we Uh, ask the CDB or the ITB in the future, and anyway, the OGCIO to perform this role to coordinate among government departments and bureaus. On liaising with other bureaus, uh, apart from the GCIO uh, who will be doing it, uh, if necessary, I will also speak to the relevant colleagues. I understand Mr. Charles Mock's point. Some government departments may be offering a service. Uh, for which fees may be charged, and for example, a member of the public uh, may wish to access some information, and if fees uh, can be charged, then this is tricky. It's not a service, it's a data set. Well, normally, whether or not it's in electronic format or not, fees may be charged for accessing such information. If this information is made public, there may be financial implications. So for the government departments, it's not an easy task. And we also need to 
uh, consider the financial implications because some for some services fees may be charged. I understand that, but comparing to um, other jurisdictions, uh, su such information is often uh, free of charge can be made available to the public, and uh, Hong Kong. At present, well, that's not the case, and the progress is very slow. Now, I understand your explanation. But my question is whether you can enhance your role and whether you can really get the support of the higher echelon of the government for this to be implemented. Otherwise, uh, that will be the same next year. I can go back and consider it, but in the past, I also encountered the same problem, and uh, we needed uh, much time to iron things out. And as for preparing APIs, if we can ha have a uh, comprehensive uh, API, um, then that would be great without the need, uh, the help of other government departments. Mr. H. Chen, my question is on GAF Wi Fi and developing mobile apps. Now, at the special FC or oral questions and uh, during motion debates, I, 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 I raise the same questions. But perhaps uh, nobody listened to the filibustering exercise. Now, first on um, Gulf Wi Fi, the government uh, did something, but it was said that the connection was not good. For example, for sports complex, I received complaints that uh, no Wi-Fi connections are available in um, function rooms. Uh, they can only access the internet in corridors and um, uh, etc. So, have you reviewed this problem? Uh, have you just uh, hung up uh, certain uh, transmitters and then just leave things at, as uh, they are? Uh, regardless of whether uh, other people have access a bit farther away, because it's really outrageous. Only uh, uh, you can only get Wi-Fi connection in corridors, but not in rooms. On the low utilization rate, in para 15, you talked about the five enhancement measures. Number five is to roll out uh, publicity or coordination promotion campaign on government mobile apps. Now, is there any uh, responsibility? For example, uh, should they ex um, assess how many downloads there will be for a particular mobile app or for uh, how how frequently will the apps be used because many people just download the app and then just uh, leave it idle so there there should be a high um there should be a we should we should demand more now, uh, some departments only look at the number of downloads, but in fact, the, the number of colleagues in that department far exceed the number of downloads already. Now, first on Wi-Fi, we need to look at quality on top of quantity. For over four hundred uh, for over four hundred venues with Wi-Fi connection, we ha put up a sign. Um, Seeing that Wi-Fi, Gov Wi-Fi is available, and we will ensure that within the range, Wi-Fi will be made available. Of course, uh, around around corners in in uh, toilet cubicles, technically, uh, the connection may not be feasible. But we have indeed um, deployed staff uh, to visit. The venues to ensure that there is stable Wi-Fi connection for venue users. Of course, there are also constraints, and uh, at the venue, for example, the number of users uh, connecting to the uh, system at the same time, whether there are any obstacles, uh, etc. But we'll try our best to ensure a stable Wi-Fi connection service. And I'll defer to uh, my colleague for the other question. Now, uh, Mr. Chen, for your comment made at the special FC meeting, we have received your comment and we are responding uh, to your complaint. And we have uh, prepared five enhancement measures to support mobile app development to make sure uh, people know that the mobile apps are good and to ensure a um, 
to ensure that more people download、um, mobile apps, and we've also prepared a, a set of guidelines for developing mobile apps. We've also organized training sessions to help colleagues, so that they can improve their design、uh, of the mobile apps, because. Uh, poor design may affect the number of downloads. Now you talk about promotion. At the central level, we also have promotion and publicity efforts. For example, earlier on, for more commonly used gov、uh, government mobile apps, we prepare pamphlets for distribution. And after distributing these pamphlets,、uh, some. Mobile apps have seen an increase in the number of downloads, and we also have short APIs at MTR stations, introducing to members of the public、um, government mobile apps, and we'll continue to do that because、uh, mobile apps are really trendy, and、uh, there are、um, a massive number of apps on the internet, and. If we don't do much on publicity, then sometimes after we prepare government mobile apps, the members of the public may not be aware of them. And on the other hand, we need to cater for the needs of the public. And I need to emphasize that the mobile apps may not be suitable for each and every one of the seven million people in Hong Kong. Some people are maybe more interested in a particular app. The number of downloads may not be huge, but they can indeed、um, cater for the needs of.、Um, Those who are interested in 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 a certain area, Ms. Claudia Mo, thank you, Chair. E-government. Well, it's said that Hong Kong ranked the fifth place among the world, and we performed excellently. And we also ranked the first in terms of digital economy rankings 2010 in Asia. So it seems we're doing a good job. However, we're hastily proposing to set up the Innovation Technology Bureau, and some say that、uh, we are not doing the too well in terms of digital economy. And if,、um, in fact,、uh, it seems that we rank the top places. Now, my question is regarding the 460 government websites. Well, it said that.、Uh, Um, a more user-friendly version has been prepared for PWDs,、uh, but not all government websites have upgraded themselves to the level required. Now, for the Braille system, well, this can easily be done. My first question is, why do we need to wait till 2015? The other question is on the 85 government mobile apps. Now, how much? Money is spent on designing these apps. Is it really quantifiable, or、um, have the colleagues of、uh, government department prepared them、uh, by themselves? Now, traffic, leisure, health, education, right? These are possible areas. What about news? I am quite、uh, intrigued. What news? Are you talking about、um, about traffic incidents or major traffic incidents, say in a tunnel or what, or about the chief executive、um, on a duty visit, or、uh, is it press releases、uh, published by the government information services? Thank you, member, for your questions. First on barrier free. Access. All government websites are barrier-free websites,、uh, but the point is we have been demanding more over the past two years. We take the initiative in asking government departments to comply with the higher standard, which is the latest standard、uh, at AA at level AA. And we set down this target. We hope that the government departments could complete the upgrading exercise in 2013. But then we have to revamp the whole website.、Uh, but then I would like to emphasize that all government、uh, websites are already、um, uh, barrier-free. So all 
um, those with uh, visual impairment and hearing impairment should be able to browse our websites. And also you talk about uh, the Government Information Services website. And if you have downloaded that, uh, well, you see that uh, for the information contained there, usually they would be government notifications, for example, consultation documents being released, or whether they have been major news uh, published and so on. So the selection is uh, in terms of uh, government information, and I do encourage you to download that um, apps. Well, it's about government information or press releases, for example, on um, hawker licensing, whether or not there has been any public consultation or review. So yes, uh, there are many documents, but then uh, it's not about uh, what is happening. Yes, that's true. It's about uh, the release of information or documents. If there are notifications, then well, the um, OGCIO has also come up with this um, mobile apps that's called uh, Government uh, Notify. For example, uh, typhoon signals, uh, food scare incidents, or traffic news. So we'll make use of this um, uh, Gov Hong Kong notify push. or push notifications. So we are worried about uh, brainwashing uh, news. Next, uh, UC Wing. Well, as the paper sets out, well, in terms of uh, digital economy, we ranked number seven in 2010. But now it's 2014. So in terms of digital economy rankings in 2010, we rank number one, or we rank first uh, in Asia. But how about 2014? So have you hidden something that shows what we have seen with regard to government data? It's lagging behind, so it's outdated. And also, I agree with what Mr. Charles Mock just said. So I think it's just um, a comparison, but then the most uh, realistic thing is that um, every year we set a target and then we will produce uh, APIs for the purpose because uh, after all the users would be our general public and also the tourists or visitors. From that perspective, the, I think the Wi-Fi issue, I've been asking this on several occasions. So I've been asking if we do have a target, for example, what's the coverage like last year and this year well, what is the percentage of coverage and how about next year? So I hope that it's not too high a demand. We hope that uh, at the end of the day we can increase the coverage to full coverage. We do hope that there can be an improvement every year and in some of the mainland cities they are doing an even better job than we do. But of course, um, and, 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 and indeed uh, our city is a lot smaller than they are. And also on the immigration departments, You talk about um, the mutual use of automated clearance service since December 2013. Well, you do this uh, with uh, the uh, with South Korea, but then not too many people are using that. So only 1,800 South Korean passport holders have applied for enrollment to the new service, and uh, in Hong Kong, there aren't that many either. Only 4,900. So you. Um, set it out as one of your achievements. But um, with regard to immigration department uh, programs, uh, to what extent are you involved? And by that I mean the participation or involvement or the development and also how it's rolled out and, pub and publicized. So I'd like to know the interaction between different government departments and bureaus. So can the administration answer these two questions? Thank you, Mr. Bly. First, um, on the uh, Gov Wi-Fi program, we do have this target, as we reported last time. At present, uh, we have 10,000 hotspots throughout the territory. They are all free Wi-Fi service, and we hope that by the end of this year, we will have some 20,000. As regards the free Gov Wi-Fi program, well, by the end of last year, we had 23,000, and this year, we have already got, so we're going to increase that uh, to 
2,530, and then by the end of this year, it should reach 2,700, and then for the GUF Wi-Fi, free GUF Wi-Fi, by next year, instead of 450 government venues, we're going to increase that to 6,000 or 600 uh, with 3,000 hotspots. And we have also put in place this, that is uh, for local Wi-Fi service. If we can provide free service or partially free service, then we'll be using one single brand name. And then the, gov the public have also voted on that. So we have used the name uh, Wi-Fi Dot, and we have already got 3,700 hotspots for that. And we have set ourselves a target that is uh, by the end of the year, we're going to have 6,000 hotspots. With regard to bureaus and departments taking part in the program, well, individual departments has their own IT teams and the technical staff within that team have been deployed uh, by the OGCIO and then they'll be working together with the departments and bureaus and then for major programs we will also deploy directorate officers to sit in their steering committees to work together with the departments and bureaus on this um, Wi-Fi program. Well, can I ask a follow-up, Madam Chair? Well, as far as the immigration department is concerned, you're just playing the role of a consultant. So in terms of the actual operation and publicity, that will be done by the immigration department itself, right? Well, we will deploy some professionals to station in the immigration department to work together with them. How about publicity? It has nothing to do with you. Well, that will be done by the department itself. Okay, if there is nobody asking in the second round, I'd also like to ask questions on government Wi-Fi. Well, just now you gave us a number of figures, but then in reality, many members of the public are finding it difficult to access uh, Wi-Fi um, in public places, for example, in the downtown area, unless you pay and patronize some um, cafes and so on. You won't be able to have access uh, to Wi-Fi if you're just uh, walking on the street and so on. So they hope that the government will provide greater support to them. And I understand that the administration is now working on this so that our Wi-Fi uh, receivers uh, can be installed on light posts or lamp posts. But then um, I would also think that uh, it's quite a difficult task. So if you want visitors and everyone else to be able to access Wi-Fi very readily on the streets, then it's not just uh, about giving us uh, more uh, hotspots and so on. You will have to indeed uh, seriously consider how that can be rolled out. And also on um, cloud computing platform. Yes, the government has set up this platform. How many government departments are already using this? Or is there a program to extend this to more departments and bureaus? Because we've been receiving uh, budgets or estimates uh, from individual departments and bureaus. Apparently, uh, they have not mentioned that they intend to use uh, your Gov Cloud service. Apparently, they're going to develop their own platforms. So how will that be uh, rolled out? In fact, we have two cloud platforms. One is uh, what I what I call Gov Cloud just now, and under this Gov Cloud, for some of the common e-government services. For example, the Human Resources Management System and also the Government Record Service and also the e-procurement service as well as some uh, workflow collaboration platform where they can all use the GovCloud platform and in the coming two years, about 30 departments and bureaus will be using that. With regard to specific departmental operational systems, custom made for those bureaus and departments, they will continue to use their own individual systems. Another cloud platform is the um, Aegis platform, the e-government infrastructure services. So all front-end e-government services have been developed uh, on that basis and we are already supporting 111 e-government services in the in this platform. And the other is um, the um, public cloud system and uh, we use uh, external service providers and use 
the platform that they provide, for example, uh, the collaboration platform and also servers uh, for the preparation of uh, websites and also uh, uh, for organization of uh, uh, virtual meetings or video conferencing and so on. So we'll use uh, such public cloud platforms and about a dozen or so bureaus or departments are using such platforms. So I'd like to find out more. So other than what you just told us, for bureaus and departments, you're helping them to upgrade their IT infrastructure. Will you be giving priority to using um, cloud platform? Because very often when we approach government bureaus and departments, when they told us that uh, they intended to upgrade their uh, IT systems, uh, they always told us that uh, they had no intention of using the Gov uh, uh, cloud platform. So whether they are going to use it or not, Will that help save uh, resources and also the renting of a certain centre and so on? So can you let us know as to how many government departments and bureaus will be migrating to the cloud platform in order to save some space or rentals and other resources? Well, at present, um, under our programme, as I just said, we have adopted this strategy so that we will be focusing on the common uh, platform or common uh, use. As for new systems and new services, if uh, they are suitable to be placed on the cloud platform, we will recommend that to be used by departments and bureaus. One example is for the low-income earners. The, um, the low-income um, earners subsidy, well, that would also be placed um, in the government cloud platform or Gov Cloud, And we have just uh, started a, res a study on enterprise architecture of the government and after that's done, we can then take a look at uh, what is more suitable to be placed on the cloud platform. So you will continue to do that. All right, thank you. So we'll wrap up our discussion on this and then we'll move on to item five. It's about enriched IT classes and we'd like to welcome the government representatives All right. I understand that uh, the administration has prepared a PowerPoint presentation, so please try to be as brief and concise as possible so that more time can be set aside for discussion. So who is going to do the presentation? Mr. Kuang? Yes. Um, let us know when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll briefly go through the purpose of the enriched IT classes and also the major components. To identify uh, young people with talents at an early stage, we plan to select some schools with potential so that uh, they can set aside one class of normal size uh, so that they can provide intensive IT training in order to nurture students uh, with potential. In Hong Kong, in terms of uh, IT practitioners in Hong Kong, the manpower grew by 18% from 2008 to 2012, which was among one of the fast, fastest growing sectors. With increasing development of IT in, in almost all areas of economic activity, we can expect an increase in the demand for IT talents. And schools are the best ground to scout and develop IT talents. In students' formative years, if they have early exposure 
coupled with intensive training on logical thinking and creative problem solving, it will be conducive to nurturing them into innovative and capable IT professionals and tech entrepreneurs. There are two areas for the enriched IT program. First of all, there will be enriched IT classes set up in partner schools to provide intensive IT training to students who are interested in talented in IT. The second area is to have enriched IT activities to be organized by other secondary schools to foster a pro-IT atmosphere in the school community and to arouse students' interest in IT. Now for IT class, we propose to have partnership um, with uh, professional bodies and universities and enterprises for a five-year program to uh, nurture IT talents. We propose to set up uh, up to eight partner schools, which will set aside one class of normal size in each form from secondary two to secondary six for more intensive IT training. Students will need to study the school curriculum uh, and apart from that, they also need to devote two to three extra hours a week for more structured advanced IT curriculum and also more in-depth and technically advanced um, courses. And the schools will need to collaborate with universities, uh, professional bodies and enterprises in designing curriculum, providing um, learning support and offering uh, other learning uh, and training opportunities. Now, a sustainable support of the tertiary institutions, IT professional bodies, and IT corporations is required. We will select up to uh, eight secondary schools, and all secondary schools will be invited to submit proposals. And we will um, look at the uh, track record in organizing or participating in IT activities, availability of IT subjects. Uh, for Hong Kong DSE and IT facilities of the team uh, of the schools, and uh, the other area is IT activities. We will request the secondary schools to organize up to three uh, or at least three IT activities in uh, school year, and through participating in these IT activities, students can help uh, can be assisted in uh, their. Um, innovative thinking and creative thinking. For, um, examples of IT activities include IT projects, short courses in app development, um, uh, seminars in business intelligence, and uh, we expect to fund up to 50 activities a year. And between 2015-16 and 2022-23, for these eight school semesters or school years, uh, we uh, expect to nurture uh, 1,000 graduates from IT classes and 400 plus IT activities. And graduates can have uh, better performance in the D Hong Kong DSE ICT subject. They can also acquire the IT um, certificates and also get the learning experience. And uh, those enrolling in ICT and also, um, and the, uh, the number will be, uh, increase, and uh, we expect to have uh, seventy-five million dollars for the nine-year program, sixteen million uh, of which will be used uh, for acquiring, upgrading, and maintaining IT facilities, thirty-four million dollars for uh, running IT classes uh, by the eight schools, partner schools, and nineteen million for supporting IT activities and also sharing of deliverables of IT class and activities and also another $6 million for the necessary upgrading and addition of IT facilities, etc. We're going to set up a, a steering committee uh, with members comprising the OGCIOs, the, uh, the tertiary institutions and uh, representatives of the eight partner schools and the steering committee will be responsible for supervising the program and also advising on the program and also enlisting the support from uh, stakeholder groups um, and uh, IT corporations. This is a two-pronged program. 
and it's uh, an innovative initiative for schools, for teachers, students, etc. After 2017-2018, we're going to review the uh, result of the program and also another review in 2020-21 to, uh, to review the way forward. All right, I see Mr. Charles Mock, also Mr. Uh, Ms. Claudia Mo uh, raising their hands. So five minutes each, Mr. Charles Mock. Thank you, Chair. I support the Enrich IT program in this year's budget. I heard the Financial Secretary announcing this program and on improving the IT curriculum or the ICT curriculum at the Hong Kong DSE level and also for um, IT related courses in tertiary institutions. Uh, of course, this program will help uh, to a certain extent because we have um, lack of man IT manpower at the moment. Now, my question is, this is under the OGCIO's purview. Uh, it's uh, separate from the Education Bureau. Of course, I see a representative from the Education Bureau here today, so there must be some liaison between the two uh, units. But now we will be talking about the um, fourth consultation, the IT fourth, uh, fourth, the IT consultation for the fourth phase. And uh, sometimes I wonder why things have be have to be so segregated. Why is it that uh, on an education the OGCIO will be commissioned? And I also have some questions on this program. First, on the uh, on IT class, I think um, you need more explanation on these on the curriculum. Are you going to supplement uh, more information as because you are still preparing for the curriculum? And secondly, for the five to eight partner schools, what will be the selection criteria? Uh, what will be the process, the timetable? Many will be concerned, as you said just now, uh, that you will be selecting schools which are already having a good track record at the moment. But we don't want um, elite schools uh, only and um, other schools not getting any help. We don't want to see a digital gap here. So what will be done? And what about students? What incentives will be given for them to take part in these IT classes because they, apart from extracurricular activities, need to s devote uh, several hours a week for um, the IT class. Uh, will they be qualified for um, uh, el elite selection uh, in tertiary education enrollment? And also, there are IT activities for schools other than the uh, five to eight partner schools, but the resources available uh, is not sufficient. Only some some six hundred uh, or six million dollars or so, because the majority of students don't study in the five to eight partner schools. Will more resources be allocated to the remaining schools so that more students can benefit? I think the biggest problem is that in the majority of schools, when I visit these schools, the students told me that these uh, schools do not have ICT classes for Hong Kong DSE. Um, um, maybe this problem cannot be solved here. Maybe we need to discuss it at the education panel. But under this program, is there anything that can encourage more students to uh, take up ICT uh, courses in the secondary schools. Uh, so these are the questions for you. I see not many members are here, so may I carry on? Uh, how can you encourage more students to study ICT? And how can you encourage schools to uh, organize ICT classes and for more schools and students to benefit? Mr. Lai, first question whether this is solely under the purview of OGCIO. In fact, starting from the um, very first day, the Education Bureau has been working with us in formulating ideas and designing the program. We also need um, participation from various sectors, the uh, uh, 
academia, business sector, etc. As for the IT class, we have already prepared a uh, draft um, curriculum, a uh, framework on uh, the curricula for students from secondary two to secondary six. Now we are not trying to groom them to become IT programmers. On the contrary, we want to help them uh, bolster the foundation and also to nurture their logical thinking skills and also to uh, enhance their problem solving uh, with the use of IT. In fact, in Para 13, for all secondary schools, we will uh, set in Para 13, we will be inviting them to submit proposals. We will look at the track record of um, these local secondary schools in organizing IT activities, the, the school's IT teaching team, the track record in participating in IT activities in the past, as for the other part of the question, whether uh, not many schools have IT classes for Hong Kong DSE, in fact, out of 400 secondary schools or so, almost all 400 or so secondary schools have ICT uh, classes, um, albeit that uh, the students number of students are not many. And uh, on whether there should be uh, IT ICT classes uh, during secondary four to six, we believe so for them uh, so as to help students perform better. Um, at present, only about seven percent or so of students obtained the five uh, asterisks, uh, whereas for physics, uh, the uh, the percentage is over twenty percent. So at present, um, the situation is quite weak. That's why we want to uh, um, roll out this enriched IT program to help students um, pr perform both in, uh, within and outside the curriculum. Of course, uh, quantity is as important as quality. I won't start an argument with you here. Um, I understand not all secondary schools have ICT classes. Perhaps I'll follow up on this question on another occasion. Now, just now, Mr. Mock talked about the lack of resources for IT activities. You haven't answered him. As for the eight partner schools, we uh, or the uh, altogether, there'll be 24 activities. Uh, because each will be expected to have three activities. I want to clarify this point. Let's see if I'm correct. So for the 50 activities, those, I, from what I heard just now, were for the schools, apart from the eight partner schools. So there should be 30 um, other schools, and each schools, sorry, should be 30 schools. Each will be organizing one activities, whereas for the eight partner schools, they will be organizing three activities. So the same problem. Will you allocate more resources for the remaining 30 schools? Because uh, there aren't many resources. Uh, we try, we'll try our best. We want to uh, benefit more students. Next, Ms. Claudia Mo. Not many will oppose this program. But generally speaking, as far as the education policy is concerned, you are promoting IT. What about sports? What about culture? Like Mr. Charles Mock said, perhaps we should follow up on this issue at the education panel. Of course, IT professionals are necessary. But now, under this program, I heard that uh, you will only select up to eight, just five to eight partner schools, and then you look at their track record, their teaching for, um, resources, etc. Now, my concern is that in the end, uh, we will only help those schools uh, that are already performing well. Those with good track record will be given more resources. And for those uh, schools uh, which are just so-so, you just ask them to organize uh, 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 an activity or two. So you're not really helping um, those in need. So there is a problem with giving equal opportunities. 
and also $75 million for a nine-year program, and you expect to groom 1,000 IT professionals. On average, $75 million divided by 1,000. The cost is quite high. So if that's the way to do the calculation, you may not readily agree with what I said. In the end, I just uh, have this small question mark. I'm not questioning the entire program. All right, apparently some $19 million, close to $20 million, will be used uh, on reviewing or experience sharing sessions, and only $6 million will be used for necessary upgrading and addition of IT facilities. How come? The distribution is so strange. In the end, what I'm most concerned about is for the schools that have been selected. So in the education sector, so you're actually recommending them to be IT elite schools. So is that a good approach? How come just uh, how come so few? Why don't you extend it to more instead of five to eight? Why can't it be? Uh, 15 to 28. So if you can increase the number, that would not lead to this embarrassing situation. So people will have to um, fight their way in order to get enrolled into those schools. Because um, well, you might not be talking about a very large sum, but then you're talking about uh, well, up to a million dollars uh, for IT activities, IT facilities, and also IT curriculum. So, would you not uh, not worry that uh, it would be like a pork barrel uh, sharing? And we don't want to see that uh, happen. Well, for the $19 million, it's not just uh, for experience sharing. It's for supporting IT activities, $50,000 $50, for each activity. And then we're talking about... Um, uh, 30 schools, so $50,000, and that would be for 8 years. So it's for 8 years. And then for the first year, is for preparation. And also some resources will be set aside after they have completed their enriched IT training. We encourage them to share the experience, and the materials can also be shared with other schools. So for the $19 million, uh, that would be mainly for supporting IT activities. So you will just uh, be helping those who are already doing well. You will not be helping those who are not uh, doing very well. We hope that we can nurture some talents with particular talents so that they can join the market as soon as possible or when they enroll into universities or if they start their own business, they will be able to make use of um, their skills. But then if we roll it out um, on a popular basis, then we, may, we will not be able to achieve that objective. So you're making clear that uh, it's um, elitist education, is that right? Well, we would not call it elitist uh, education, but then we hope that we'll be able to train up a group of students um, who have better potential because uh, I don't think it's possible for everyone to have that potential or talent and therefore we are trying to groom and nurture those talents so it's like a quality education I think it's the same concept all right no second round so I'll ask some follow-up questions then I would also like to know more about this and of course I'm prepared to support this if the administration is willing to put in more resources to train up uh, IT talents in particular starting from the secondary uh, school period I think that's good and uh, many members have asked this question so why 8? why the magic figure of 8? why can't it be more? why not 18 for example? so will you be creating a situation whereby the uh, the a strong, uh, or uh, well, for those uh, who are doing well, they'll be doing even better. And how do you select the students? What will the mecha mechanism be like? So after the eight partner schools have been chosen, many students from around the territory will be very interested if they think they have the talents or the potential, or if their parents want them to develop in this um, field, then uh, would that Will they be selected by the schools 
themselves or would there be guideline would there be guidelines or would there be a committee to select those students so who would decide on which students can go into these schools and become IT entrepreneurs uh, in the future and also you talk about uh, the 50 activities you said that uh, each proposal will be granted up to $50,000 and uh, so for every activity they will be granted up to $50,000 and then that will be for uh, AGS and 30 activities a year so who will be making the decision and uh, will there be a steering committee and how would that steering committee be formed and you also said that the steering committee will be responsible for coming up with the curriculum and um, with regard to the curriculum will you be providing us with more details and also you talk about a custom design curriculum does that mean that uh, all the partner schools will be teaching very much the same curriculum or will there be custom made uh, or tailor made curriculum for individual schools well we will give them an outline and also the key components but then uh, for the Substance uh, that will be decided by the schools themselves is very much a school-based approach because this is a novel attempt. It's not possible for us to um, come up with a one-size-fits-all curriculum. So that's just uh, an outline. And you also asked about the magic figure of eight. We did consider that very carefully, but we think that uh, this will take time and they will all require in-depth support including the profession and also tertiary institutions and also the resources to be put into it so and we are talking about an extended period of time up to eight years so after considering our capacity well initially we only saw about five but then after the consultation we have also heard from the sector that uh, they would like to see more that's why we increase that to eight, but then going beyond the figure of eight. Well, when it comes to actual operation, in terms of the manpower and the time that will be required, we may not be able to take on that much. And uh, what's still outstanding is about uh, the um, the enrollment of students. So we'll leave that to the schools themselves. So they will um, select the students themselves. Will that be guidelines, yes there will be, but then we will not be dictating as to which students should be admitted. So you give them guidelines, but then for the actual decision on uh, which student to admit, that will be up to the schools. And then for the curriculum, that will be done by the steering committee. So the steering committee will come up with a universal um, curriculum guideline, and that's for their reference, and then they can um, decide on the details so that will be decided by the schools themselves so they will come up with the substance uh, under the curriculum so that there will be a broad curriculum guideline yes they can determine on the approach to be adopted for example on programming or in a series on programming as to what language should be used uh, we have an open mind so they can decide on which language to be used uh, in teaching programming for example we also talk about uh, um, network um, engineering so they would also have a choice and also for database administration we would not be designating which database that uh, they should be using would that give rise to a problem so for the eight schools concerned they might be choosing a particular curriculum and then you leave it to them to work out the details and also for the teaching materials that they approach the experts or the universities to uh, come up with their own program but then what if they approach eight universities and come up with eight different sets of teaching materials uh, would that be a waste of resources or well, the steering committee will work closely with the eight partner schools we hope that after these partner schools have been chosen we will have about a year to go during which we can work with them to come up with the curriculum um, guideline I don't think uh, in reality all the eight schools will come up with uh, the same set of materials 
So can you provide us with more information about the curriculum and the schools and also how are you going to form the steering committee? Please do give us detailed information afterwards. Next, uh, Claudia Mo, asking in the second round, three minutes each, please. For this program, I have reason to believe that uh, you are doing this out of good intention, but then the more I hear it, I am becoming more anxious. Because uh, for education, the most important thing is to um, educate all students irrespective of how well they do. And you're trying to create this atmosphere of uh, information and technology in the campus. Well, that's indisputable. But then, in any case, uh, just five to eight schools uh, to be selected by you, and there are such it's, um, it's only a handful of uh, schools, and you're talking about in-depth support and also extended support, and no more than eight schools will be selected. Well, actually, in terms of uh, IT learning, you are trying to um, classify them into two different categories. So this elitist approach is not giving people a good impression. So have you considered any alternative approach? So that the education sector will not feel so badly about this. So they will not feel that bad. Yes, thank you, um, Ms. Mo. Please do not feel bad about this, because uh, this has nothing to do with uh, being elitist. Uh, so we just try to do it as an experiment. And the resources will come from teachers who are able to teach such subjects, uh, because we will be very demanding on them. And also, some partners of the sector will also have to work with them. So it's not just uh, about distributing some um, leaflets and then they'll have to follow um, in the teaching. Well, this idea, this concept uh, is something that I can understand. But then I'm talking about the objective uh, result. So in reality, there will be eight uh, elitist IT schools that will emerge out of this. And uh, even if you are not prepared to consider it, uh, I cannot do anything about it. But then what you are claiming to do is that, uh, well, that's from secondary two to secondary six, and it's uh, for five years, but then the program will last for nine years. And then during the first year, you make all the preparation, and it's going to last uh, for another eight years. And then for the remaining three years, you expect them to go to the universities, right? Well, Ms. Mo, there will be four batches of students altogether. Form 2, so that will be the first batch, and then they will uh, proceed all the way to secondary 6, and then there will be another batch, so from the same school. So why can't we give the chance to another school? Well, Ms. Mo, you don't have to be worried about this. Yes, we will be doing this, and then two years down the road, we will start the review to find out if it's been effective. And if it's found to be effective, then we will also have to think about the ways and means of taking it uh, forward. Should we identify more schools so that they can also be included? Or if one school is doing well, then uh, can we extend it to uh, a couple more? We haven't made up our mind yet, because after all, this is a novel idea. And the entire concept, we have followed some overseas experience. Uh, for example, in the US, uh, they have 20 schools. Uh, which are doing particularly well in IT, so that's the US model. And we'd like to do it uh, as quickly as possible. That's why we give it a try, and uh, we try to identify as many people as possible. And then the universities have also been approached. And Mr. Mock has also asked this. That is uh, what kind of uh, uh, advantage can be offered to the students. So if there is better collaboration with the universities, then the universities can also offer some classes for these secondary students. And uh, if we are more ambitious, then the universities, if they feel that these curric this curriculum is appropriate, then in terms of IT, these students, if they are able to reach a particular standard, then they can be offer 
certain um, credits uh, so that in terms of admission, they can be given an, a conditional offer. But then does it mean that nothing will be changed in 10 years? No, that's not true. So if we feel that the approach is good, then we can expand it. But then on day one, given the fact that this is very much an experiment, uh, we dare not say that it should be rolled out uh, extensively and uh, to begin with 200 schools. Uh, that's not what we intend to do. So Mr. Charles Ma, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the government officials can see uh, the members' concerns in terms of how many schools will benefit, how many teachers, students will benefit. Uh, if um, the number is too few, uh, then only eight schools for so many years, then the, it's not very desirable. Of course, if you undertake that in two years' time, you will conduct a re review and possibly the program may expand to cover more schools. We understand it, but um, of course, uh, if uh, improvements are needed, you should uh, make improvements and uh, for uh, if the result is good, then there should be more resources and members will support you. Ms. Claudia Mo uh, is concerned about the possible labeling effect and that it may become elitist. Now, I'm not being selfish. I think the problem, on the other hand, is uh, that uh, things may get quite negative. For example, some students with, with good results may not enroll in these classes, and as said by GCIO just now, um, uh, how many asterisks or four or five for ICT in the Hong Kong DSE? Uh, I I don't get it. Uh, why don't we? Uh, why why didn't we grade them by A B C D E etc. Now um, my concern is uh, there aren't many uh, well performing students, and this reflects uh, that the perhaps they are not really. Um, uh, of a very high level. We're not um, organizing elitist class. On the other hand, we are just trying to help um, those uh, substandard students. So, of course, if uh, some schools are competent, they should be allowed to take part in the program as well. So that's just a view uh, from uh, members. Another question is, uh, that um, there will be a steering committee in the future. Please give us more information on its membership, its operation. Now, apart from um, running the IT classes, uh, you say that for these partner schools, they will also share their experience with other schools. Can you make this mandatory? Can you require them? to share experience, because just now you said that, that you would encourage the schools to do so, but public money is spent, or public money will be spent, and they are, they are already getting some advantages. For example, they will be the pilot schools, so um, there must be, they, they should also do something to justify the use of public money. Well, of course, this can be done. When schools are invited to submit proposals, we can make it clear that they will be required, not just encouraged, to share their experience. Right, to make it clear. I also like to follow up on one issue. I think in the beginning, not all parents and students may be very um, much aware of these eight schools uh, with intensive IT training, and they may have missed a chance of enrolling in these schools. Will the government conduct uh, some publicity uh, campaign that, to encourage students to grasp the opportunity? And I'm also concerned that some students may not um, Be, uh, may not have got hold of the information in time. They might have missed the uh, admission stage. And what should they do in the um, following years? And also for the eight partner schools, would they be um, in the same uh, districts? And we also consider um, students with talents and yet 
uh, unable to afford the um, uh, the traveling fees to travel uh, across districts. Uh, to answer the first part of your question, we will be rolling out a promotional campaign, and starting from 2015-16, I mean this program starts in 2015-16. Uh, I uh, we also hope that publicity and promotion can be carried out as soon as possible. As for any support for cross district. Students, I think we can consider it. I think uh, we should more or less wrap up this item. I'd like to seek members' views whether you support this proposal. I haven't heard any um, opposing voices, so uh, I take it that we all support this enriched IT program in secondary schools. All right, item six: issues relating to the producer's guidelines of radio television Hong Kong. May I first welcome? Representatives from the administration, as well as a representative of the RTHK um, staff union, and Ms. Claudia Mo has asked the panel to have a discussion on the RTHK's producers' guideline, and that is why we have included this item at today's meeting. Let's wait for the program staff union's representative in as well. Let's welcome colleagues from RTHK and also representatives from the administration. I will now first invite the administration to walk us through the paper and this item. Over to you, Ms. Ho. Madam Chair, members, the RTHK producer's guideline uh, is an internal uh, documentation to provide um, guidance for the internal operation of the uh, of RTHK. And a working group was set up in 2012 and uh, seeking and the uh, working group um, comprise staff from uh, different sections and units. Um, the role is to make recommendation on the PG revision. Now, uh, I'll defer to my colleague, as said by the Permanent Secretary, the revision of PG has been going on for four years. In September 2009, um, we had this opportunity. The uh, government decided that uh, Hong Kong, uh, the RTHK, should be the public um, broadcast of Hong Kong, and then in the following year, the uh, review of the PG to, um, began, and the progress has been slow because throughout the four years, the colleagues would had to um, spend uh, time after working hours to carry out this review, so the progress has been slow. However, the review was carried out stringently. I have this uh, strong recollection. One experienced colleague said that as long as one staff member objected to the revision, this revision should not be endorsed. So um, I think we should not neglect the importance of this PG. The working group uh, had all along has had this consensus unless it is abs um, of absolute necessity in terms of operation the PG should remain the same and, and the charter should not be revised and throughout the process the staff union and the working group talked about promotion of public values and throughout the discussions we have 
not seen any actual operational need to uh, add this phrase promotion of public values to the PG. Between 2009 and 2011, the administration conducted a very detailed consultation exercise. The LegCo um, panel, uh, this panel, uh, was also consulted, a public hearing was carried out, and at the public hearing, over 50 to 60 deputations attended. On the uh, 4th of January 2010, the RTHK also had um, their views on the PG revision, and the view was that the vision, mission, value statement should also be included in the um, section relating to public purposes and of the charter and in fact clause 4 to clause 8 in the charter has incorporated fully the vision mission and value statement of RTHK so for this proposed addition on promotion of public values to the PG the management the management's view is that it amounts to revising the clauses relating to public purposes in the Charter. Since there have been a detailed consultation process, we are of the view that a revision should not be made unless uh, the, the due procedure uh, as set out in the Charter uh, is followed. Next, I will invite Ms. Choi Yuk Ling, uh, Chairman of the Hong Kong RTHK Program Staff Union, to speak. Um, please uh, restrict your speaking limit, uh, speaking time to four minutes. And may I remind you that um, the uh, verbal speech and the some written submissions given is not protected by the electrical powers and privileges ordinance. And please uh, avoid code mixing so as not to. Um, inconvenience the interpreters. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Members. I'd like to clarify the um, item today because just now uh, I don't know whether it's intentional or not. Mr. Roy Tang, as he spoke just now, uh, mixed up the two things about PG revision and charter. So I want to explain very clearly today that um, the discussion today is about the uh, a, a paragraph um, from the PG being required by the management to be deleted. Um, the, we need to clarify that uh, there has never been any request to revise the charter. This PG uh, has been formulated uh, over a period of 20 years, and a working group uh, uh, comprising representatives from different uh, sections or units have been discussing this, uh, the controversies arising from PG revision. I want to emphasize that uh, starting from a small uh, working group uh, set up in, the, in February 2012 until f January 2013 when this draft was circulated among all staff for a consultation of three months um, and the, the revised draft, the uh, paragraph concerned uh, had to do with um, the the following wordings: uh, promotion of public values, in particular, the promotion of freedom of expression, open and democratic society, civil participation, etc. And throughout the consultation, we have not heard any um, views uh, raised by um, um, the members of staff. And in May 2013, after the formal setting up um, of a working group. The discussion uh, has been carried out on the basis of the draft revised PG, and uh, there was no um, comments raised at the uh, working group meeting. And when, well, in the PG, if RTHK is to be the uh, public service public service broadcaster, um, the 
PG should follow the wording of the chart that we have never heard such view before. So it's really hard to understand when a director has requested that the uh, relevant wording be deleted in the in the revised PG. Um, uh, then uh, we believe that that this is like moving goalposts. The uh, director is trying to come up with an explanation in his request to remove um, uh, certain phrases. And in March 2014, a strategic group meet meeting was carried out, and there were nine members with rights to vote. Other members only attended as observers. And at that meeting, the director of broadcasting chaired that meeting, and uh, all of a sudden, he proposed to delete that paragraph. Uh, members from the working group raised some comment, make some comments at that meeting, but th those comments were ignored. The uh, staff representatives' views were ignored, and at that meeting, all other eight representatives from the management were asked to vote, and indeed three members from the management um, also opposed uh, to uh, deleting those paragraph, uh, those uh, those wording, and we are angered by the fact that the the staff's views uh, have been ignored, and we're worried that such a uh, mode of governance would continue um, at the various levels of our THA's operation. We urge the uh, director to um, face up to the views of our staff members. Thank you. So the floor is now open to members. I only see Mr. Charles Mock and Claudia Mo and Raymond Chen. So let's start with four minutes uh, first, uh, including both questions and answers. Charles Mock. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can see that uh, the working group would like to add in those uh, words and phrases. On the face of it, we are talking about uh, public values, uh, freedom, um, open and democratic society, civic participation, and a caring community, and so on. That's not a problem at all. When it comes to international standards, and the reason you gave us was that uh, you've exceeded uh, the UN standards. So it's strange. Sometimes uh, the administration would just uh, use that uh, for rejecting certain things. And then when it comes to uh, universal suffrage, apparently they are suggesting that uh, they do not have to follow the international standards. Well, indeed, even if you include that, uh, the difference will not be that great because uh, the interpretation power will still rest with you. And then uh, it's like the uh, mainland academics, well, Everything is included. Uh, we are very open, and there is a lot of public participation and so on. You don't have to be uh, so uh, nervous about this, uh, give, giving rise to the anger of the um, staff, because you know very well that there is a difference. In f indeed, uh, for many people, even if you include that, uh, that's not a problem at all. And if you are not going to do that, that's going to be a big problem. So how are you going to respond to that? And my question for Ms. Choi is, in your opinion, is it really that necessary? All right, what if it's deleted? What if your suggestion is not taken on board? So what do you expect to happen if this is to be deleted? So uh, maybe Ms. Choi should answer first. Ms. Choi? All right, let me put it this way. In answering Mr. Mock's question, in fact, for this particular paragraph, as I said at the outset, uh, since May 2013, when the working group, well, uh, the union as a member of the working group, this paragraph was already there. There is no question of any particular unit or any colleague trying to uh, insert it uh, without consultation or whatever. All right, that's um, uh, the sequence of events. So would you be worried if this is taken away? Because uh, they have done it uh, in such a high-handed approach uh, uh, with full uh, ignorance of uh, what the staff are asking, and uh, these are very important wording. And in the process of the discussion by the working group, we have uh, uh, looked at uh, the UN document and also the Asian Broadcasting Authority and so on. So we have checked it out uh, with all the international documents, uh, and uh, we do not see how this uh, or this paragraph uh, could be in violation of those uh, values and so on. I think it's for the director of broadcasting to explain why he feels that. Uh, these uh, values are not in line with our charter or whatever. So would there be uh, censorship or whatever? So this is exactly what the director has been saying. Well, the management has been downgrading the PG um, to a level where it's just uh, used uh, as an operational 
uh, menu. But then there must be some values, some mission and values behind it. And therefore, if we just uh, delete those wording, so what does it mean? So I think it's for the director of broadcasting to respond. All right, director. Thank you, chairman. Just now, the union representative spoke and uh, repeatedly she referred to the word uh, mission. So I'd like to refer you to the paper that we have provided to this paper. All right, uh, on page two of the paper, second last paragraph. This is the document CB bracket four seven two six bracket oh six. All right, uh, for the um, common value, we all admit it uh, or accept that as our core value. So we do not uh, question the intention of the union in inserting this paragraph in the charter of the RTH of RTHK. We have already made it clear what our mission, what our vision, mission, and value statement is, and now the colleagues uh, are now proposing something that is not uh, included in the VMVS and they have never been able to tell us uh, why is it necessary to include this sum in the actual operation of the station. Miss Claudia Mo, well as an ordinary man on the street when we view the RTHK incident all right he might say that uh, what's meant by uh, public values and so on well Inserting it is okay, but then even without them, it doesn't mean that RTHK will collapse and then uh, it will not enjoy any editorial independence. No, that will not happen. So that's the conclusion of an ordinary man on the street. So it's purely about the management of RTHK. You're trying to exercise your power as the bureaucrats. All right, the staff union wants this, and whatever you want, I'll just deny you. So is that the case? So that's my question number one because I've been working in the media myself. So I can see that in a broadcasting station, all right, uh, well, if you're the boss and, or if you're the chief editor, definitely you have the power. And definitely they will not have as many votes as you do, but then you're actually adopting this high-handed approach and there is no discussion, no consultation, whatever. That's what they are most concerned about, all right. Uh, well, some 20 plus uh, departments and uh, 200 staff have been consulted, but sorry, if this is not agreeable to the management, then you just uh, uh, walk away. So what is this all about? This is about press freedom. And apparently this management has no vision or mission about uh, press freedom. All right, Mr. Charles Mock asked, uh, well, if, if these uh, words are taken away, uh, would that mean uh, the end of the world? No, it's almost like asking people if they should have a one man one vote, whether or not there will be screening, whether or not it's true or false universal suffrage, it doesn't really mean anything at all because uh, you don't have to care about whether or not there is screening. So long as you can have one man one vote, it's okay. But then how about people's uh, principles and vision and mission and also basic rights? So when we look at RTHK, the context is about press freedom and editorial independence. Those are the guiding principles. All right, uh, for the director, you have to parachute an administrative officer and you have to play your role as a bureaucrat. And I find it most regrettable. The deputy director, Mr. Tai Kin Man, you are actually making concessions. Originally, we had expected uh, that there would be discussions. And then for the staff, we are promoting this. And if you do not agree, you can change it to we believe it. So why, how about adopting the words we believe in public values and yet the management is still is saying no to this too. How can that be the case? You are a broadcaster run on public money. So this is, a, this is still very much a very popular station or broadcaster and yet you are drying it up uh, spiritually. So RTHK, don't talk to it about money. Actually, there is no way that it will work. Well, in terms of funding, all right, the pro-establishment camp is trying to dry you up uh, with uh, um, a cut in the funding. So whatever you try to do, well, even if it's uh, a big thing or sh or small thing, all right, uh, you have somebody uh, parachuted uh, from the central authorities. Well, on the name of it, on the face of it, yes, he's still the broadcaster. Of, uh, he's still the director of broadcasting, and yet you are making life very difficult for the broadcaster. I think this is most immoral on the part of the government. So, who would you like to respond to your question? All right, I can fully understand the sentiments of Miss Choi. 
Okay, if you look at uh, uh, bracket three of a particular ordinance and so on, I think it's a waste of time, Miss Choi. Well, I'd like to take the opportunity. I'd also like to deal with uh, the PG and also the so-called RTHK Charter. What's the relationship between the two? I find it regrettable because often a time, the Director of Broadcasting would say that uh, for the suggestions under the PG, he would take it to mean that we are asking to change the Charter. This is not an appropriate uh, interpretation. In fact, the PG, since 1998, when there was no Charter for the RT for RTHK, we already had the PG. It shows that uh, it's a working guideline, it's, uh, a it's a support in principle for the, uh, for the staff. It's very important. That's why in the process of our discussion and so on, we have never heard that, um, well, when we try to propose any uh, revision to the PG, then we will have to work on it. Uh, we will have to follow uh, follow word by word uh, the uh, charter. If that's the guiding principle, then I would have a lot of skepticism because uh, the director of broadcasting assumed his uh, post in uh, September 2011. How come in 2013, when you circulated the draft to all the staff, you already had that paragraph? How come in the first paragraph, when you talk about uh, RTHK as a public broadcaster, it's not like uh, what the director just said. You would be copying that word for word from the charter to the PG. So I think uh, that there is this uh, uh, implication that you've moved the goalposts and still the director has failed to justify it. All right, director. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe that uh, the union colleagues will have to look at the paper before them. So for the promotion of public values and the paragraph that they just cited in 2010, 2010 February, when we had the first draft, uh, it's already there. So it's not that uh, in 2013, in the expanded uh, representative meeting, we um, introduced that. And of course, in 2010, I was still working in the Labor and Welfare Bureau, and therefore, I could not possibly have seen it. And then in 2013, in January, when it was circulated to the staff, uh, there was no th discussion whatsoever. So the first time that was that it was discussed, uh, it was uh, in on the 24th of September 2013. I don't know if you were there. I was already there, and I said that if you talk about values, then we will have to follow the charter. That's why I I don't understand. Is it because the chairman of the union was not there? That's why you brought up that view. Second. When this document um, in sub in March this year was brought up for discussion again, the chairman of the union was also not there, and I also brought that up again. So probably you did not understand the process of discussion because you were not um, there at the meeting. That's why you brought it up. Yes, Mr. Raymond Chen. Chairman, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the chairman of the staff union in bringing up this principle because the PG was there before the introduction of the Charter. So, Director, you will have to explain that. So, what's the link between the two, the producer's guideline and also the Charter? And uh, is there any um, support and, uh, is there any uh, relationship between the two? Is any one of the document being subordinated uh, to another one? So, without this paragraph, is there anything that cannot be done? And uh, would the scope be further narrow in the future? So, on the contrary, I'd like to put this to the director. With this paragraph, what is going to happen? Does that mean that uh, they'll be able to do whatever they like? Does that mean that uh, the, um, they'll be able to do whatever they want? So, director, what's wrong with the proposed paragraph in promoting public values? Do you think that uh, this is an unauthorized building works? Or is it that uh, this has been plugged out of thin air? So I'd like to give enough time for the director to respond. Thank you, Mr. Raymond Chen, for your question. Now, on the PG and also the relationship with uh, the Charter, I would not use the word uh, subordination. But then I'd like to stress that uh, RTHK's Charter is the Charter or the Constitution for RTHK. It sets out RTHK as Hong Kong's public broadcaster is a mission, vision, and values. In so you can imagine if there is another code of practice for this department. And if you read the PGs, they have to do with 
um, the uh, operational matters. Of course, they should not exceed the constitu uh, or go beyond the constitution uh, for that organization. Well, there was a four-month consultation back then, and the electrical panel was no also consulted. At that time, all the vision, mission, and value statement of the RTHK was thoroughly discussed. At that time, there was no su suggestion that apart from the original mission and vision, we should also add this phrase of promotion of um, public values. And in fact, the charter has been expanded to uh, cover certain matters, including editorial independence. There was actually an independent clause on this in the Charter. Anyone who wished to, to amend the uh, Charter could make the uh, suggestion, but must the man management heed the view, because the Charter is signed by three parties. Um, if there is an internal working group uh, in RTHK and then makes a suggestion outside the terms of reference and then RTHK unilaterally revises the charter, then we believe this will be too reckless and it will also set a bad precedent because we don't know in the future who will also suggest revising the, ch the charter further. I think this is a bad um, allegory, uh, Chairman, uh, uh, um, Director of Promotion of Public Values. Uh, if this is a mini constitution. You should explain to, um, to us why this um, Alteration of the charter is against the uh, against the uh, constitution. But it's very simple. If it doesn't exist here, it doesn't exist. Next, Miss Emily Lau. Well, uh, someone's coming in. I heard about the the uh, the uh, saying about the road to hell is uh, paved, um, good intentions, etc. Well, Mr. Roy Tang is uh, famous for making. Um, such remarks. Now, are you suggesting that this um, proposal is leading RTHK to hell? Well, this quote isn't from me. Um, I know, I know this is not from you. This is uh, you quoting some of these remarks. What I'm saying is, by quoting this, are you suggesting that uh, they are leading RTHK to hell? I think Miss Emily Lau's understanding is wrong. Um, the conclusion that I made was very clear. From the management level of RTHK to the program staff union, if either one of them uh, believe that the things should be included in the charter uh, to their liking, then this is reckless. There are provisions for amending the charter. And then, without following the provisions, without following the procedures, and taking matters in their own hand to amend the charter, I think this is uh, reckless, and this is why I make I, I quoted um, this saying. Well, no matter what, you should not say that uh, this will lead uh, the uh, station to hell. You should not have made this quote. You should not be accusing them of um, making way uh, to hell. The, um, uh, director, do you really understand Chinese? Why uh, have you um, make this a uh, allegory? Well, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, further uh, explain. Um, Miss Semley Lau is entitled to her own interpretation. I'm just interpreting from. Um, what you said, and there is a statement from the staff union, and they are very dissatisfied. They have they have not been consulted, and uh, what you have done uh, has been brutal. And then they are worried that uh, if you just force your way, uh, regardless of staff um, unions' uh, views, uh, they are concerned uh, what will happen in the future. Uh, you will just bulldoze through any proposal you want. And then 
um, at the last paragraph, uh, this will be submitted to the editorial uh, board for approval in the near future, and they're urging the staff members to speak up and director. Now, things are really confrontational. Uh, do you find it regrettable that uh, your relationship with your staff has deteriorated to such an extent? And the second question, this meeting, has it been held yet? Has all decisions, uh, has a decision been made? This meeting hasn't been held. Um, time is needed for uh, translation uh, of text into Chinese. So, uh, so this meeting isn't held yet. Coming back to uh, Ms. Lau's first question. Of course, it's obvious that um, we all want a good um, working relations with colleagues. But if some colleagues have made suggestions that have clearly gone beyond the scope of the charter, and if the RTHK then unilaterally revises the charter, regardless of the views of others, uh, I think it's very irresponsible, Madam Chair. I'd like to ask uh, what uh, Deputy Director thinks. Now, on the revision of PG, the controversial uh, wording um, don't doesn't exist in previous uh, versions. In 1998, the it was first draft. Uh, it was first uh, formulated, and then in the uh, Subsequent versions in 1999, year 2000, etc. Um, these versions didn't contain such wording, and subsequently uh, there were suggestions to include this uh, paragraph, and that's why it was discussed. And um, concerning the mentioning of freedom, uh, openness, etc. And democracy, etc. Th there is a relevant uh, provision in the text. For example, uh, it sh we emphasize uh, without favor and fear. Uh, and in 3.1 of the PG, there is also the saying that uh, we should. Um, uh, you know, concerning the freedom of expression and civil, democratic and civic participation, etc. Otherwise, it would be a dereliction of duty on our part. So, in the PG, uh, it is clearly set out that we should safeguard uh, democracy, freedom, uh, etc. Uh, please allow the representatives uh, half a minute to respond. I just want to please speak into the microphone. I'd like to clarify that the director of broadcasting is still mixing up the PG revision with um, revising the charter. I think it's pointless to carry on this discussion because we're having it on a different basis. Um, the director is forcibly uh, changing the uh, PG, and uh, he said that it's against the constitution. He said it's leading uh, us to hell, etc. This is the first time I heard uh, about such remarks. I think uh, I feel shameful, and I feel find it regrettable. On the twenty fourth of um, September, that was the first meeting of the uh, the first strategic uh, working group meeting. I have this. Uh, uh, I have the minutes. I also attended the meeting, and it set out very clearly the justifications for such a proposal. And it was suggested that the paragraph were uh, departing from the UNESCO definition of public service broadcasting. The working group uh, or our union then had three meetings. We had in-depth discussions on uh, this point. We also drew reference from other uh, international uh, organizations. And we thought that um, the director must have had some misunderstanding. And then in March 2014, the um, director just brutally exercised his power to uh, delete the or strike down the proposal. So if this PG is one of the provisions under this so-called constitution, then um, le about promoting the freedom of expression, openness, uh, expanding public spheres, pluralism, etc. How are these against the constitution? 
Are you saying that the existing PG is also against the Constitution, as uh, Mr. Tai already mentioned, that such values are also contained in the uh, current uh, PG? So should these uh, exist? Should these even exist in PG or not? Is it really against the Constitution or not? Uh, I'll ask the director to respond, but before that, director, I just received a, uh, a motion from uh, Ms. Caldiamo. This meeting is scheduled to finish at 4.30, and I will extend the meeting uh, to 4.45. Some members have also raised their hands to speak, so please be succinct when you speak in a moment. And I hope we have time to deal with the motion as well. Director, our viewpoint is very simple. If the charter is revised, to include new values, uh, be it values proposed by the staff union or other otherwise, and through extensive consultation, if the charter is revised, then of course, as the mini constitution uh, being the PG under the charter, it can be revised. However, we should not put the cart before the horse. This is. The RTHK Charter and it has not been revised, and that is why no new values should be added to the PG. It has nothing to do with what values the staff union would like to see included in the PG. The point is, since the Charter hasn't been revised, the PG cannot be revised. On the UNESCO's definition, the uh, issue is even more complex. About the promotion of public values when it was first proposed, staff union representatives and uh, working group representatives at the meeting on the 24th of September 2013 submitted that it was a direct quote from the definition of public service broadcasting adopted by UNESCO. And at that time, um, members of the staff union and the working group believed that it was a direct quote from UNESCO's text, and the management did not believe so. In the end, uh, we looked up uh, the definition and found that it was not the case. So um, that was the background about mentioning the uh, definition. Second round, Mr. Charles Mark, we don't have much time. Two minutes, please. I think. The staff union and the working group is not trying to take the director to hell. They're trying to take the director to heaven because it will be better to include this bit. Now, um, director, you talked about the charter, but it was very controversial back then when the charter was passed. Many objected to having a charter to confine the uh, terms of reference of uh, the public uh, Service broadcaster. Many already view this as a draconian uh, charter, but now it's an uh, objective fact that you're making use of this charter to confine the role of RTHK, and you are still using the charter as an excuse to prevent uh, addition of new values in the PG by the uh, staff uh, union. So you're just trying to uh, rely on this draconian charter to explain uh, what you're doing. Uh, I don't have much time. I understand you're going to repeat your answer anyway. On Claudia Mo's motion, I think she is very mild. I have no idea. She is uh, very mild. She's not forcing you to make your position clear. She's just urging the management of RTHK to respect the staff members' views and also to um, give play to editorial independence. Now, um, this meeting, all along I uh, haven't seen many members here. Now I see members coming back. Maybe they're here to vote. I urge members from the pro-establishment camp to consider um, this motion. By respecting the values, that means these values should be adopted. I don't want director to respond anyway, Mr. Ray Chen. No, I raised a hand first. Ms. Ms. Mo, we want to go first, okay? 
Now about the road to hell, this this uh, to hell with good intentions. Now this famous quote is about hypocrisy. About about uh, hypocrisy is. Now you talked about um, the RTHK management, the staff union, and other um, units. Now, um, Assembly Lao asked whether you understand Chinese. I ask whether you understand English. On the other hand, you're just translating from the English quote, and uh, it's beyond our comprehension. I have to say that you uh, don't have a very good proficiency. They were all right. Uh, you're pointing to them that uh, well, you have no idea. As to what you're asking, you were not present at a particular meeting. But then this council has to express its regret because this is a public broadcast uh, operated on public funds, and then you and the staff union have to engage in such kind of a dialogue in this council. And then you're accusing them of not being present at the meeting. That's why they were not in the know. This is really shameful. So these. This is something internal within the department, and yet they have to come out. And uh, the staff union feels it feels so aggrieved that it has to speak out and uh, bring it up in the public arena. So I don't know. You've been paid so handsomely. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. So I have to ask you. So did you ever? Attempt to say that well, all right. Uh, this is the PG, and this is the English version. And now you have to translate it into Chinese, and then the uh, printing has uh, is completed, uh, and it's um, a fait accompli, and nothing can be done about it. So I'm not asking you, uh, Roy Tang, to respond to that. I'm asking Mr. Tai Kin Man to respond to that. All right, both uh, um, the director and the deputy director can respond. Chairman, I've repeatedly said this. That is, um, anybody. It's not just about the management or the staff union. Anybody from outside RTHK, if he feels that um, the values of um, RTHK as a pro public broadcaster can be changed at whim, then that's a very dangerous notion. If we allow that to happen, if we allow anybody a free hand, then that's being irresponsible. That's all, Mr. Tai. Well, for the procedures. Well, the English version has been completed and will translate it into Chinese, and then after both versions are available, we'll be submitting it to the um, program committee to discuss it. So you are forcing people to accept it, right, Mr. Raymond Chen, Madam Chair? It's obvious that uh, the management of RTHK and the staff union has no communicate have no communication at all with regard to RTHK's charter and also the producer's guideline. Their interpretation. Well, have only been set out clearly uh, today. All right, the staff union said that uh, they are not trying to amend or revise the charter. All they are trying to do is to include this paragraph in the producer's guideline. But then Mr. Tang is saying that uh, in doing so, it's tantamount to amending the RTHK charter. So the discrepancy is very wide. So that cannot be dealt with. Uh, in the next uh, few minutes, all right, uh, all right. The director said that uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I, I don't know if you will feel uh, happy about this because apparently he's suggesting that uh, you have good intentions after all. But then, if RTHK's charter is the constitution, and if it's silent on this, does that mean that the producers' guidelines cannot include this? So we're just talking about the spirit. Is it against the spirit of the constitution? So you will have to tell the public and the staff union this very clearly. That is all right. Uh, you 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 are suggesting that uh, is kind of uh, uh, an unauthorized uh, building works. So what um, constitutional spirit is it against? Uh, you will have to tell us, director, madam chair. Well, every time when I speak, I've been using the same description. So that has gone beyond the charter of RTHK, and if you go beyond the value of uh, the charter, then we have not discussed those values. So, what kind of new values are you talking about? The entire paragraph that you just uh, referred to, that is about the public values. Uh, the Charter is silent on this, and if you feel that it's included already, you will have to point that out to me. And our responsibility is that uh, if there is any need to change the charter, there needs to be a full process of consultation with the community. We cannot just uh, unilaterally change the charter. So you're against uh, promoting public values and also uh, promoting freedom of expression, open and democratic society, and so on and so forth. Is that the case? Well, Mr. Tai said that what they've been suggesting. 
have been done all along. And apparently, you're talking about some new values. So, which is true, Mr. Tai? Mr. Tai, well, Miss Emily Lau, well, just now what we've been saying, well, pro promotion of uh, freedom, rule of law, and so on and so forth, that's been done all along. So that's included in the uh, PG. So why are you not allowing them to include this paragraph in the PG then, Deputy Director? Concerning the role of our THK. And also in the revised version, we have um, got that there. And earlier on, as I just said, in the past, uh, since 1998, if you look at the version that has been in use up to the latest version, we have not specifically mentioned RTHK as a public broadcaster's role in the previous version. Well, basically, the mission of RTHK and values have been included um, in the version. And in the latest um, revised version, we mentioned that uh, RTHK needs to uphold its editorial independence and also the impartiality as its core value. And also in the latest uh, draft, uh, we said that uh, public interest will be our responsibility. We agree that uh, as a public broadcaster in particular, um, internationally, there are certain values and mission including diversity, uh, universality, independence, and distinctiveness of programming. Well, well, in the current version at this moment, whether it's uh, the management or the staff or the working group, we all agree to those. So the only area where we have uh, different opinions are uh, that's about um, the paragraph that we just uh, referred to. And as a member of the working group, when we started the discussion on the revision, I've actually discussed that uh, with the management and also the colleagues participating in the working group. I hope that uh, the guidelines can become the um, cornerstone for our producers uh, so that they can make reference to the document as far as possible. So in order to avoid any difference in opinion, well, where there is a difference in opinion, we will have to coordinate amongst ourselves in order to resolve the difference. That's why it has taken such a long time for us to prepare the document because uh, there are different people with different p views. And basically, we have resolved all the differences. That's the only outstanding part that we still do not see eye to eye with one another. All right, if there are no further questions, then just now I've already informed members that Ms. Claudia Mo would like to move a motion. So I'd like to ask the members present, well, are we going to deal with that? Uh, is there any objection in having this being voted on? If not, then we will put this to the vote. And Ms. Mo, can you spend a minute to explain the details of the motion to us before we put it to the vote? Thank you. I believe that not just um, those of you who are present, whether you are from the press or those uh, who are watching the live broadcast, uh, you will see that you don't know what they're talking about. All right. On the one hand, they said that uh, it's nothing new because uh, these are the values that have been in that have been um, in use, and then all of a sudden they say that uh, this is something new, and therefore it should not be included. So we are at a loss. So whether it's there or it's not there, well, as far as I am personally concerned, well, even from the angle of the media or the press, the discrepancy is not uh, the gap is not so big that it cannot be uh, filled. But then, for those of us working in the press, in particular for frontline journalists who have a sense of mission, all right, uh, including this side, uh, you said that there's nothing new, and then all of a sudden you said that uh, it's something brand new. So you're not doing justice to RTHK. You're not doing justice to the audience, whether they are viewers or uh, audience <coughs> to your radio station. I'm not saying that. You have to make an about face. You have to make an about turn because it's not a binding document after all. But then, just listen. Please, do not corner people. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, so we'll put it to the to a vote as we do not have a quorum in the room. So we will have to ring the bell for five minutes. <laughs> We have to ring the bell because um, there are many members at other meetings.
我哋家陣讀緊書，即係一九年就我讀過。不如趁而家讀啦，係嘛？啊，無問政議員啊，你會唔會介意即係趁而家 ？Miss Mo， do you mind while we are waiting? Can you read out the wording of your motion? Oh, all right. That this panel urges the management of LTHK to respect and accept. The proposal by staff in terms of、um, the integrity and intention, so that、um, that would also be in line with the spirit of editorial independence of our THK. Um, do we want to claim a division? Uh, if it's just、uh, by a show of hands, that would be、uh, more expeditious. Well, so I'd like to claim a division. So this is、uh, the bell to ask people to come back to take part in the vote. So it's a question of、um, agree or not agree. So it's not that we have not made our、uh, views very clear. I think the staff union has also made its views very clear. Madam Chair, I haven't seen the Chinese version. I haven't seen the finalized、uh, draft、uh, of the Chinese version because in the end、uh, we have to look at both versions before they are finalized because、uh, the document will not be subject to revision every month or every year. So before we have seen the final. Chinese version. We are not going to finalize it. I think it's a very good question, Madam Chair. With regard to the editorial committee, strictly speaking, well, if a colleague、um, is available, then he will attend. So that would include all the directorate great staff. But then、uh, we cannot claim that.、Uh, He or she is the most representative because of all the radio、uh, department people.、Uh, very rarely would they be present. If, and if we just、uh, put up to a vote,、uh, then、uh, some representative from the rate、uh, from the radio、uh, department would feel aggrieved.、Uh, you un you understand that this council is very concerned about this. So after the meeting, please do give us the minutes of meeting and also the、uh, outcome of the voting. All right.、Uh, we are close to five minutes, so we will have to put it to a vote. And、uh, Ms. Choi would like to say a few words. Please be brief. I'd just like to supplement some information to this council. Well, on the fifth of March,、uh, the working group was dealing with the draft, and there were four units of、uh, staff that were present at that meeting. And in fact,、uh, they represented close to 200 staff. They've already consulted、uh, their departments, and they were inclined not to delete that paragraph. And we also asked that at the editorial meeting,、um, the staff suggestion would also be discussed at the meeting instead of just、uh, maintaining the 2003 version or to support that deleted、uh, version, or、uh, because that's not fair to the staff. But then, with regard to the views expressed at the、uh, meeting. The management has yet to come up with a response, and I'd like to take the opportunity to ask them to heed the advice from the staff. I can see that he's shaking his head. All right, I will put it to the vote. Well, some members just、uh, join us. So once again, I'd like to read out the wording of the motion moved by Miss Claudia Mo. We'd like to urge our THK's management to respect and accept the views of、uh, staff on. LTHK's、uh, conduct and、uh, intention by adhering to the spirit of editorial independence of LTHK. So please、um, indicate by a show of hands. Will those in favour please raise their hands? I'll read out your names:、uh, Charles Smock, Ronnie Tong, Claudia Mo, Raymond Chen, Emily Lau. Those against, please raise their hands. Anyone who is against, abstentions. Christopher Chong, Anne Chiang, Stephen Ho, 
Christopher Zhang. 呃,我們的結果呢就So <笑> the voting result are 5-4, no against, no one against and uh, four abstentions. So the motion is carried. Item 7, um, AOB, if there is none, then our meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming.